Good morning, my friends. We are now going to be working our way through guidelines for conduct of members of Ananda, which we're actually calling the Ananda way of life because it isn't. The guidelines are helpful for everyone who aspires to self-realization. And before we start with the prayer, I want to make a small little announcement, advertisement. Many of you know Keshava because Keshava best because he sometimes chants when I'm do, giving classes, and he's also been giving for the last year a Friday morning program on Whispers from Eternity. Um, the three of our staff members, Saiganesh, Lakshmi, and Keshava, have all been doing one day a week of morning programs. Saiganesh and Lakshmi have shifted over now to a Tuesday evening program that they do together. And Keshava has now finished the cycle of whispers, at least for now, and he's going to start a new series um, just each week singing and then talking about different one, a different of one of Swami's songs. So it'll be a musical program and also inspirational poetry, the poetry and all the things related to that. The timing of that is going to be Friday at the same time as this program. So I've been doing four days, and Friday's been open at 9 o'clock. But now at 9 o'clock, Keshua will be bringing in his um, adventures in Swami Kriyananda's music, which should be lovely for everyone. So now let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, dear friend and guide Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to all. Help us to feel your guiding presence that we may understand as we discuss and meditate on these beautiful guidelines for right behavior, that we may understand how to bring our own lives in more perfect attunement with these uplifting principles. We are your children. Guide us and bless us that everything we do be a harmonious expression of your divine will. Om. Peace. Amen. Now, this is the 2015 edition of something that was first put out in 1986 or 1987, as I recall. First copyright was 1987. And when this was actually started, it was called Rules. Um, And it was called Rules because it is traditional for a monastic order to have a rule. That's just how it's always been thought about. We followed the rule, which means that the rule of St. Benedict, the rule of St. Francis, the rule of St. Ignatius, whatever it is, it means these are the principles, but they really aren't rules. They've never been rules. They've always been guidelines. So more intelligently, more accurately, we've called them guidelines now. There are several introductions here explaining different iterations, but none of them are important except for our discussion, except the very first one um, that Swami Kriyananda wrote here. Um, You know, I I believe they were called rules at the beginning, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But the fun thing about them, I remember from the first time I read them, is that there's not a rule in here. There's just a suggestion of right attitude. And then when you have right attitude, right behavior follows. So I'm going to start by the four or five paragraphs that Swamiji wrote, in 1987 when he first published this. So, he says, These guidelines for conduct for members of the Ananda Sevaka Order have evolved through many years of practical experience, both in the development of Ananda World Brotherhood Village since its birthing period, 1967 to 69, and in my own earlier spiritual life as a direct disciple of the great master Paramahansa Yogananda. The guidelines presented here are based on the present realities of life of life in an Ananda community. 
For many years, these guidelines were defined not as rules specifically, but rather as a growing body of traditional observances. Now, I've, I've introduced a lot of this, saying that we didn't start with the written document and then tried to mold ourselves to it. The document was written 17 years, 16 years, 17, 18 years after the project started. And so Swami himself says, this was entirely as it should have been. For who would be so foolish as to fit a person to a new suit of clothes rather than fit the suit to the person? As Jesus said in the Bible, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Astonishingly, systems are often built on preconceived theories alone with no practical reference to the human realities that they are meant to affect. Swami um, often talks about, I think it's yeah, I think it's called the Republic. Plato's essay for an ideal community. He writes, I think it is the Republic, and he writes all these ideas about how a perfect society should be organized. And uh, and Swamiji says, what is less well known? That document is well known and still studied. He said, what is less well known is that a wealthy patron supported Plato to try it. And it was an absolute catastrophe (laughs) because Plato considered every possible ramification of his ideas except the fact that it would have to be lived by human beings. And it involved, you know, like an egalitarian attitude toward partnerships, toward family. You know, children belonged to everyone. There was no uh, monogamy in marriage. You know, just this open sort of uh, communal ownership and uh, access to each other's homes and possessions. I believe that's true. I read, I read that, I read that essay my first year of college, my my brief abortive, disastrous college career, and I found it so uninteresting that when it came time to write about it, I just wrote something completely other that interested me more. And I got an F. (laughs) So what I'm saying is what I remember what Swami said about it. But it was just a complete catastrophe because it just came from first with an idea without any practical relationship to human nature. Swamiji's way of leading has always been to start with human nature. And also to have a realistic Sanatana Dharma concept of how people evolve, which is slowly, with free will, from the evidence of their own experience, not from an an imposition from the top of some well-crafted but unrelated theory. So he says, it's astonishing how often people make the suit of clothes and then try to squeeze the people into it. The purpose of these guidelines, then, is primarily to explain and clarify a way of life that is already in existence, and thereby to guide the members of Ananda further in their efforts to grow toward perfection. This is how Swami always describes it, to guide us in our efforts to grow, not to impose upon us a set of behaviors, but to show us the pathway that will lead us to our own um, desired perfection. Ananda communities are essentially not only spiritual, but also monastic communities. Now, I'm offering this whole discussion, even though this is for members of the Ananda Sevaka monastic order, because most of these guidelines apply to anyone who's serious about the spiritual life. And yes, there is a certain assumption of seriousness here, but I think I can freely make that. So he wants now us to understand what a monastic community is, also because we're redefining that word for Dwapara Yuga, because we're including householders and families. We're not just thinking of celibate monks and nuns. So he says, the Ananda communities are monastic in the dictionary accepted sense of a community that renounces worldly interests that are centered in ego gratification and in the quest for personal gain, and that, and that is instead wholly dedicated 
to living for God alone, to serving Him, and to becoming united with Him eventually in spirit. And so the dictionary definition of monastic is we turn our backs on egoic self-interest and we turn our attention toward divine fulfillment. And thus, whether or not one lives in a community, wherever you're living, one can always turn away from egoic self-interest and turn toward attunement with the divine. And that's what makes us monastic, not, um, not any other aspect of life. Any, no outward form makes you monastic. What makes you monastic is that you have turned away from the ego and turned toward God. And so everything that we're going to discuss in this book is, okay, then what does that look like? How can I, how can I bring that abstraction down to a very specific um, principle that I can then use in my daily life? Then Swami says, May these guidelines for conduct help to point the way to perfection For those who have accepted the ray of the divine light that was brought to the West by Paramahansa Yogananda, and that is expressed through Ananda village and all Ananda colonies located throughout the world, with divine love, Swami Kriyananda. Now, one of the factors about this, and I have called it the Ananda way of life, I have not called it self-realization for all, because these specific guidelines are oriented toward people whose inclination is to follow the path of self-realization, discipleship to Yogananda and this whole line of gurus in the way that Swami Kriyananda has brought it to us. You can see there's a lot of steps from that. And one of the things that we sort of, that I, I do want to make clear here is one can be a disciple of Yogananda, one can take initiation one can uh, learn discipleship initiation, one can learn Kriya Yoga and practice it. And all of that exists in this enormous ocean of Yogananda and this line of gurus of that inspiration. And then within that greater family, um, individual disciples feel the inspiration to share um, the, the, their, the ray of grace they have received from the guru in the way that they feel the guru inspiring them to do it. In the Indian tradition, spiritual lineages are not institutionalized or organized. They're carried on by individual disciples. And it's expected that the guru's overall mission will be expressed with nuances by each individual disciple as they feel called to do it. So Ananda, as a community, it's by no means the definition of what Swamiji has done with his life of discipleship, because he wrote books that are unrelated completely, you know, to the Ananda community way of life. But within that, Swamiji picked up this aspect of the work that Master wanted done, which was to make communities, and so he's defined this out. And these rules of conduct are for those who, who, who deeply feel in tune with the Ananda way of life. This is in contrast, for example, to the Naya Swami order, which Swami started in 2009. That, that gives homage to Paramahansa Yogananda and that line of gurus, but it is not, a, is not even an expression of discipleship to that lineage. It's renunciation for all, no matter what spiritual path, uh, no matter what lineage of Sanatana Dharma one follows, the Naya Swami order is a universal order for those seeking God through the path of renunciation. So, now, what is included in this booklet, the way it was is published now, is in 2003, which was a long time later than 1987, after Swami Kriyananda began to live in India, actually just a month or two after he moved there, and Ananda was establishing itself in that culture, in that country, um, for the first time since Swami was there in 1962, but the first time for Ananda. And Swami had a profound inspiration, which he called the Way of Ananda Sanghis. 
And then he articulated the fundamental principles and practice of, of uh, the Ananda Sangha in, seven, and in six major points, actually. And that's all. Now, I did a whole series on the uh, way of Ananda Sanghis. I myself find YouTube impossible to understand. But somehow or another, I think if you typed in the way of Ananda Sanghis or something like that, you can find it. So I'm go not going to... I'm not going to repeat that. I'm just going to turn the page. It's written in the PDF that we're making available with these recordings. It has the way of the Ananda Sanghi and the, and the tiny little additional introductions. Now, even though this has been edited slightly, for example, it was called the Ananda Monastic Order. Now it's called the Ananda Sevaka Order. The word rule may have been there somewhere. Now it's called guidelines. Maybe it was always guidelines. I can't quite remember. Small changes, small changes of organization. But fundamentally, Swami never re-edited this from 1987. So it, it has stood the test of time all these years. Now, to be a member of the Sevaka order, one has to reside in a community. Um, because this, it, this goes a step to actually be a member of the Sevaka order. Um, the decision has been made you have to be uh, a resident in the community. We have a lay order, in essence, which is called the Sadika order. And it's based on all the, exactly the same principles, but there's no residence requirement for it. I'm just saying these things in case it comes up. Now, having said all of that, now we're going to deal with the principles. There are, let me see how many articles there actually are here. Thirteen. There's thirteen articles, and this is article one. And it is membership defined. Who are we and what is Ananda? That's the question being answered. All Ananda members are renunciates in the deeper sense that we try to sublimate our ego identity by expanding it to identify with the universal self. Um, I, that word sublimate is, an, is a word that Swami uses. I'm trying to conjure up exactly what the meaning of that word is. It's not suppression. It's that the interests of the ego become less important. I mean, the way, what it means is that we expand beyond it. That we don't suppress it. We don't hate it. We don't war with it. It just becomes um, subservient to a higher cause. And subservient in, in its, its proper order. Um, I was thinking just about, you know, how a, a, a loving mother may have a desire to do this or to do that, but those desires are sublimated to her, her love for her family. You know, or the father may have a desire, the, the breadwinner in the family, so we don't make these gender rules, but the breadwinner of the family may have a desire to do many other things in their life. But all of those other desires are sublimated to the higher calling of taking care of the family and providing for the children and, and facilitating the, the success of their lives by sublimating his personal wishes because they're less important to him. This is a very important understanding because sometimes people think of renunciates as mean that we crush the spirit. And one of the aspects of Master's entire um, message, and very specifically Ananda's, is Swamiji says you, we, we transcend the ego by um, not by, not by um, doing violence to it, but by gradually harmonizing our self-expression with a higher motivation, with a higher awareness. We realize that the ego is just a limiting definition of self, and what we really want to be is, is an instrument of the divine. So self-expression is not frowned upon. It's the um, inspiration for that self-expression. And we're monastic in the sense that we are sublimating egoic-based desires to trying to be in, to to the higher value of trying to be in tune with God, that's what all monastics are trying to achieve, 
is just that the traditional image of monasticism is that our self-expression is constantly suppressed. And self-expression itself is defined as ego. But that's not true. Because the divine expressing through it is an expression of the divine. It depends on motivation and attitude. And see, that's where everything about these guidelines is the attitude with which we do things, not the thing itself. A person could be a a world-famous actor or musician or writer, and there could be no ego energy in it. It's simply what I was called to do. Swami Kriyananda himself was extraordinarily prolific in his creativity, in, in uh, writing and in music and in organizing and in teaching, all of these things. But they, it was all done as a desire to serve Master. And it was all done with an ego, with a, with a, uh, a, a disinclination, I would say, with, without, without the ego principle. But the individuality can still express as an expression of God's unique individuality through us. And that's entirely different. So this is just the first sentence. You can see we have to really contemplate this for a long time. Um, Our means of purifying every desire and attachment is above all to offer these up in meditation for consummation by the infinite bliss. So we take the little self, we offer it into the infinite self, and we ask to be an instrument. How can I serve? And the way Master put it, Master had a perfect prayer. I will reason, I will will, I will act. But guide thou my reason, will, and activity to the right path in everything. And that's, quote, our way. By that he means this is the Ananda way of life. I mean, the examples that we have of both Master and of Swamiji, they were extraordinarily active and dynamic, and they, and they initiated and they were creative, and they left a huge legacy of original work. But it was not done for self. It was all done for the divine. And so we ourselves, Swamiji encouraged uh, you know, creativity, even wrote a book, um, about the artist as a channel for divine energy and um, self, creative self-expression as a pathway to self-realization. You see, this is very radical because the traditional monastic order has you, it emphasizes, and we'll talk about that here, just you do what you're told, you don't have your own opinions, you don't assert your own way, you try the, as hard as possible not to be noticed and that's, I mean, that, that is a method, but it's not our way. Our way is to freely, dynamically, fearlessly be yourself, but to be the self that is the capital S instead of a constant affirmation of the small one. Now, that's the principle. How is it carried out? Well, that's the, that's the whole challenge, isn't it? Swami says, we have come together as a community of of spirit. Our primary purpose is to find God by meditation and by service to God through our fellow man. So now we have the beginning of how is it actually done. And, And because there are physical Ananda communities and because these guidelines are written for membership, in the Sevaka order, which it has a residency requirement, we have to understand what those communities are. We have come together as a community of spirit. So we may have physical places where we live, we may work together, we may have aspirations for how we develop our communities. We, we can have schools, we can have divine services, uh, we can have practical realities, gardens, Um, energy sources, all the things that develop over time with our set of values in a physical community. But that's not why we're together. I mean, a community could come together for the sake of agriculture, of being an example of of biodynamic organic garden methods. Or they could be to demonstrate, um, you know, uh, 
alternative energy sources or innovative building or um, innovative architecture. I mean, there are communities who come together for those reasons or to demonstrate a new kind of economic system or a social experiment for human relations. All of those things could be true. But Ananda is a community of spirit. And our primary purpose is to find God by meditation and by service to God through our fellow man. So anything else that follows is secondary to that primary purpose. So every principle, every decision needs to be made according to how it facilitates the spirit. And then, of course, we also have to do things in a common sense, practical, effective manner. This doesn't, this is not license to be careless in every other aspect of life. When Master talks about his training with Sri Uteshwar, his own guru, he says, Master never corrected me in spiritual matters. But, but, but Master said, as a young man, he went there when he was just a teenager to his guru's ashram, he said, somewhere along the way, I'd picked up the idea that because I was a, a, a serious spiritual aspirant, I could be careless about how I behaved in the world. And he said, Sri Yukteswar firmly and unequivocally <laughs> um, made it clear to Master that uh, mere meditation did not give him a pass in, be, in his right behavior. And in fact, Sri, one of Sri Yukteswar's mottos was learn to behave. So it does follow that we have to learn to behave, but Swami is telling us that to be a member of this order is to have made a commitment to seek God alone. And, and that is, that's fundamental. Now you may think these things are self-evident, but they have a sneaky way, or I should say, life has a sneaky way of confusing you. And, and making you think that you're still on track when you've actually drifted away from your first principles. So that's why Swami wants to make it very clear we're monastic because we've turned away from ego gratification and we're seeking attunement with God. We are primarily a community of spirit. And our one purpose is to find God by meditation and service. Also, it's twofold. We are not either a contemplative order or an entirely simply active order, both together. It's the inner attunement inspires the outer activity. And once again, if you have any, if you do the slightest bit of exploration, you'll find that the rule that governs monastic orders often says our, we come together in order to form schools that are based on these principles to teach children. We come together, you know, for this or for that. We come together to find God through meditation and service, to turn away from ego gratification and to turn toward God. Our lives are offered in openness, its channels to the divine light, in order that by loving cooperation with God's grace, His light through us may expand its influence on earth. So what we're also saying is that we are here to uplift the world. Because there could also be a principle that says, we renounce, we have nothing to do with the world anymore. But it says, as instruments of God, we are praying to be channels for His light. And then turn that energy toward our brothers and sisters for the sake of uplifting the world. And that also, that's also a principle of Ananda, service to God in our fellow man, by, by being instruments of his light. And this helps us fulfill the monastic definition. We are not here to develop our own talents to the max. We are here to be instruments of the light and then to let God decide how he wishes to express through us. So my friends, that's half of Article 1. And when we start again, we'll continue from there. God bless you, my friend.